Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey everyone, welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I am Jason Romano. Really excited about our guest today, Jim Morris, the rookie. You remember that movie, that Disney movie that came out in 2002 and depicts the great story, the motivational story, the encouraging story of Jim Morris from high school baseball coach to Major League Baseball pitcher all in the span of a few months. But before we get to our conversation with Jim, I want to tell you about our sponsors and partners here at Sports Spectrum, Ronald Blue Trust, applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help clients make wise financial decisions to experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy, especially with the pandemic and the quarantining and all that we've been going through with the coronavirus. Now is the time to get connected to Ronald Blue Trust and learn about how you can make sound financial decisions going forward in what appears to be an uncertain time for all of us. Check out the website, ronblue.com, ronblue.com to learn more about the great work Ronald Blue Trust is doing. Okay, we mentioned our interview. It's going to be with Jim Morris, and I am so excited for you to hear this conversation. He's got a new book out, June 23rd, 2020, it releases. It's called Dream Makers, Surround Yourself with the Best to Be the Best. And if you know that name, Jim Morris, and remember the movie The Rookie, it was put out by Disney back in 2002. It's still out there. Disney Plus has the movie available to watch at any point. We just watched it this past weekend, my daughter myself and my wife, and it was great. It was nice to watch a movie that we hadn't seen in probably five or to six years, and it, it just it, it gives you chills when you finish watching it. It's such a great story, and Jim lived that story as a baseball player, originally selected way back when, January of 1982, by the Yankees, and a year later, selected by the Brewers. He played a little bit of minor league baseball, never made it higher than class A ball, and Pretty much at that point, you realize that maybe your career is over, went on to become a high school teacher and baseball coach in Texas. His high school team wins the state title, and then Jim fulfills the promise to the team that he would try out for a Major League Baseball team because all of a sudden, at the age of 35, Jim Morris is able to throw 95 to 98 on the radar gun. So he goes for a tryout. The team says, well, I'm not really interested in a 35-year-old pitcher but I am interested interested in a dude who throws 95 to 98. He moves quickly through double A and triple A. And then with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, he makes his Major League Baseball debut at the age of 35 in September of 1999. And then, of course, we know the story, at least that led to the movie from Disney's The Rookie. Great movie, a great story. Jim Morris has a wonderful, wonderful story encouraging story to share on this show take a listen to jim morris the rookie he joins us here on sports spectrum jim welcome to sports spectrum no thanks jason glad to be here it is good to talk to you jim i'm excited to to have you on the show let's start with the quarantine time first before we get into the book quarantine 2020 the pandemic that we're in how are you all doing with your family and just the idea of being, you know, sort of cooped up and locked in and, 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 and doing this whole, you know, isolation thing like we're all told to do right now? I'll be honest with you. It sucks. But yeah, yesterday, my wife and I were walking before we had a FaceTime chat with the kids. And I thought, man, I should hide my own Easter eggs. But then I would know where they were. So it wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> and you know, it is what it is. And everybody keeps asking me, they're like, so what do you think it's going to look like on either side? I we have no idea. We don't know what the new normal is and we're not going to know for a long time. They've still got a lot of facts and figures they need to put together before they'll share whatever truth they want to come out with us. And for the people who don't listen and aren't, are not taking it seriously, just don't be dumb. Yeah. You know what? I'm a public speaker, and right now I can't speak in public. So I'm sitting at home. You can sit at home. And, well, what are you doing? Well, we bought a microphone. We bought lights. And lights don't make me any prettier, but we're going to start doing virtual meetings. And sometimes change comes naturally, and sometimes you're forced into change. And right now we're being forced into change. We're being, our comfort zone is being stretched. 
But by and large, the majority of the people I've seen who have either been grocery shopping or anywhere else I've seen them, they are taking this seriously. They are coping well, and they're not letting their anger and madness get to them yet. And I just, I pray for everybody because this is a tough time. And this is, you know, I, I heard, don't ever say this is something we've never seen before. But in my lifetime, when we used to, in elementary school, when I used to hide under the desk from an atomic war, which yeah. would help, by the way, the little metal desk, but yeah. we've never had anything like this before. They put the whole world out of commission for like this. Yeah, It's not even a war. Basically, it's a war, but we're the top of the food chain and we're being taken down by something we can't even see. And I think that's a little bit tough for people to see. It is. Um, and even from a faith perspective, I know that, you know, for us, our church, you know, we're doing church a lot differently now than we did two months ago where everything's virtual. But you try to find the positives in the in the uh, inconveniences. What are the, some of the positives that you've seen come out of this, whether it's from a faith perspective, sports, from speaking, from just being, you know, with your family more? What, what's some of the positives that you've seen out of this? Faith-wise, I think it's been kind of a neat deal because there are certain guys I'll watch on TV, Robert Morris from Gateway, Stephen Furtick from Elevation. Sure. And I've watched their things go from like 28,000 to 100,000 views a week to half a million to now a million. And people are starting to tune in again. I don't want to make any comparisons because I don't want people to go, oh, you're that type of person. But yeah. Since 9-11, people have not tuned in to church like they have since I've been around. And all of a sudden, it takes a catastrophe to bring people back to their faith. And when you spend time with your family and it's constant time, you realize, hey, they are important to me. Why have I been working so hard? Why am I out of the house all the time? Why can't I be here? And I think sometimes God hits a reset and gives us a little chance to collect ourselves and go, you know what? When I quit and I don't do this job anymore, it's not going to be on my tombstone. This is the job he had. Right. I'm going to be a father. I'm going to be a husband. I'm going to be a granddad. I'm going to be a great granddad. Those are the things I want on there who had time to spend with other people. And that's the other part I want on there. Work-wise, it's hard because we get used to the grind. We're going to work, we're coming home, we're spending time with the kids, the wife, we're getting up, we're getting ready, we're going to work, and then it's just this routine, and now our routine's been stretched, and we don't like it. And so far, we're handling it quite well, but in my house, you know, when we travel, when we're home, that's our vacation. Right. And now we can't travel, and so we're stuck home, and now we don't want to be here because somebody told me to stay home. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like that little kid reverts back and goes, well, I'm going to go outside, and you can't stop me. And you're just like, you know what, just grow up. Yeah, that's all you can do. Jim Morris is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Of course, the rookie and the movie that Disney made about his life is, is on Disney Plus right now, actually. I went back and watched it this weekend in preparation. I had watched it, but it's been a, probably five years or so since I last saw it. And it was nice to get a, a sort of refresher on your journey, Jim. But before we go down that route, which is an easy route to go down, I'm sure, for you. But you have this new book out, which I'm excited about about called Dream Makers. So tell us about that book. It's releasing right now as we tape this June 23rd, 2020. Tell us about Dream Makers. Dream Makers is a compilation of questions and answers that I've been asked over the years during my speeches. And the biggest one has been, since all this has happened to you, what has happened since the movie? What has happened since baseball? What has happened since you walked away? Yeah. And there's been a multitude of things that have happened. And so this book kind of attacks all of that. And it's, it's a, still a story about me, but it's about the 50 surgeries I've had since baseball, since 01. It's about the opiates the doctors handed out like candy and you take them because you're having surgeries and then you're just on them. And then that doesn't work. So you know what? We'll add our own concoction in there. We'll throw in some vodka. And sometimes we're our own dream killers. And we don't know how to handle things. We don't know how to cope. We just see it getting worse. Every time I would go to the doctor, they would go, well, this is just part of Parkinson's. You're going to get worse. It's just going to happen. And I got tired of hearing all that stuff. And so Dream Makers is about surrounding yourself with the best people possible to be the best you you can possibly be. It's a line out of my speech. I've talked about it for 20 years. But in my instance, it's actually correct. For the first 15 years of my life, I watched 
my parents treat each other in the worst way possible. You promise never, ever to do that in a church. But from 15 to 18 with my grandparents, they showed me what dream makers were. They, sh they showed me how to shake hands firmly, look deep in the eye, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. The most important person at any given time is the person standing in front of you right now because they deserve 100% of your attention. Wouldn't you want that from them? Mm. Character, integrity, faith, by all means. They were... They had grace and compassion before grace and compassion became a deal. So back in the greatest generation time, when I was still a teenager and watching my grandparents and how they did things, they made Thanksgiving dinners for families that couldn't afford it, Christmas presents for families with kids that couldn't afford it. Out of their own account, they'd pay a bill for somebody just so they could keep their dream going on a little bit longer. And they didn't want anybody to know. That's just who they were. And so they showed me the total opposite of how I grew up for the first 15 years of my life. And the next three, they taught me how to be a good man, a good husband, a good father, and a person of faith. And it's that faith that has sustained us like it has through all the surgeries, through the Parkinson's diagnosis, to, and this is in the book, to having a group of girls. I call them my girls, right? And you're, you're going to like this. My girls are raised age range from 50 to 90 and they're my prayer group that prays for me and anytime we're on the road and something happens they're on it and so they prayed for me and they prayed for me it talks about i've gone back to the neurosurgeon and they've done a brain scan and oh you don't have parkinson's anymore hmm. well that's what the girls were praying for and so it's just a journey about life and it's good things bad things it's ups downs it's all of life and it's about the people who make the good life possible the dream makers the people you want on your team I love that. It's going to be great. I can't wait to read it. Dream Makers coming out June 23rd, 2020. Make sure you pick it up. It's uh, it's going to be out soon and it's going to be a great, I think it sounds like a great summer read too. Hopefully we're getting back to some sort of normal where we can go to the beach and hang out. And and uh, this is the perfect book to pick up for that. Jim Morris is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Let me ask you a little bit about the aftermath. You talked about the 50 surgeries, which I didn't. I don't think I knew that many surgeries had taken place and certainly the Parkinson's uh, diagnosis and all that. But it sounds like it, there were some dark times for you that you kind of went down. Would you say, now that you look back, certainly having a movie about your life, there's got to be a lot of positives about that and just being able to tell your story. And certainly I'm sure you've heard from many people who've said your story inspired me. And that's the good part of this. But there can be some bad to all this too and having your story out there and fame. Is it is it the you know the the the, the blessing and the curse all wrapped in one when you look back at that? experience of having a movie out about your life no it's just still surreal to me it's yeah? like did that really okay. happen are you sure that happened <laughs> and then and then dennis quaid will call me and i'm like i guess it happened because dennis quaid has my phone number so i guess that's working <laughs> yeah. and it's just we get in life and we go through things and it's not until the, the hindsight that we go wow if i'd have made this decision or that decision many things would have gone differently but you know what? I didn't. This is where I am. This is why I'm here. Well, let's battle out of that and let's develop our next dream. What are we going to do now? And people want to know that from me all the time. What are you going to do now? You're like 56. And I'm like, well, thank you for memorizing my age. I don't really appreciate that. But, and, but people are interested in people who've had movies made about them and people who entertain and people who sing and people who are athletes yeah. And so it's not a curse at all. Now, people know a little bit more about me than they would the average person, but I don't mind that either. I mean, when the movie came out and Dennis goes, somebody asking, they're like, what do you think about this being a G rated movie? And they're like, well, we thought about going back and throwing a word in here or there. And then I looked at Jimmy and I thought, that's who he is. Just, just leave it like that. And so it's not a curse at all. It's definitely man, I've had a good time with this. I've met a lot of people. I've gotten to travel all over the world and I've gotten to see some incredible sights I never would have seen in person being in a classroom or yeah. being a coach on a, a baseball field because that is your time. When you're a teacher and a coach, you're there constantly. And to be able to be afforded that time now and, and see Rome and see the Sistine Chapel and everything else has just been a blessing for me. And we have not taken any of it for granted. We run full force into into faith, man. That's what's carried us and has sustained us. So let's keep That's it great. going. That's great. I, I'm glad. I'm so glad you said that because sometimes, you know, those things that 
that hit us are, are, are mountaintop moments. And I'm not saying this is your mountaintop moment, but it's a big deal. Obviously, when somebody does a movie about your life, that sometimes that, that, hurt, that can hurt a lot of people and they take the turn for the worse. Or maybe, you know, uh, certainly you said you've had your dark times and your dark moments. Certainly 50 surgeries is, is not easy for anyone to deal with. But I'm glad to hear that, that it's a blessing and you're able to kind of embrace that versus being the guy who was in a movie and you're like, I don't want to talk about that. I moved on. Was there ever any moment where you were walking through and you're like, man, I'm so tired of being called the rookie or hearing these stories of people like, I just don't want to talk about that anymore. Was there ever that moment for you in this journey of, I guess, almost 20 years? There has been some of that. Sure. And as you're traveling around the world and you're speaking and you've got Parkinson's and I never believed this until I was in the throes of it, but they say, when you have Parkinson's, you have a fatigue that is unlike anything you've ever known. It's at the cellular level. And I would get up and I was still traveling by myself at the time. And I would go do a speech and I would get to the hotel. I would sleep until I talked. I would talk. I would go back to the the room and sleep until I had to get on a plane. I would come home. I would get home and I would go to bed until my night. And that's how I lived for like seven years. And that part of it got old. But I think that as one thing falls away, God brings something else into view. And I've, I have said many times, I, what is the next thing I want to talk about? What is the next realm I want to go into? And so for 15 years, my wife and I were trying to write this book and the ending wasn't coming. And then it's that thing. It's not in my time. It's in God's time. And if he would just tell me what the bottom line is, I could go from there, but he doesn't work like that. And so he gave me the ending of this story, which I think is fantastic. And there are going to be some people who, who boohoo it and things, but you can't argue with medical science, right? You have Parkinson's. Oh, you don't have Parkinson's. So where are we going to go now? And you can't go, why do you consider this a miracle? Like some guy who asked Dennis and I, when we're doing the junket movie junket and traveling around speaking, he goes, how do you know this was a miracle? How do you know that when you came back going a hundred, this was a miracle? I said, how do you know it wasn't? Hmm. I said, there is no medical significance whatsoever anything i've done everybody has said there is no way you can throw you can't throw hard you can't throw harder that is impossible it can't be done you're 35 you weigh 250 pounds you should be retiring and now you're just getting started how do you throw 12 miles an hour harder god we'll get back to our conversation with jim morris in just a little bit but want to tell you about our friends at ronald blue trust The company's certified financial planning professionals offer comprehensive financial planning and investments management services based on biblical principles, that's important, to individuals and families across the U.S. who are beyond the debt problem stage but want to be good stewards of their wealth. A while back, we had on Don Christensen from Ronald Blue Trust on the Sports Spectrum podcast, and when you heard him, you saw a guy who loves Jesus who knows how this thing works with the financial track record and how uh, how the market works in the sense of what we need to do and stewarding our money properly from a biblical perspective. That's what Ronald Blue Trust is about. So check them out at ronblue.com, ronblue.com, and learn more about the great work they are doing, and maybe they can help you in your financial endeavors, ronblue.com. Now back to our conversation with Jim Morris, the rookie, former Major League Baseball pitcher, now inspirational speaker and author, joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Let me ask you about that faith. You've you've talked about it a little bit here and there, and certainly you said your grandparents were a a big um, influence on your faith. Tell me about that, that walk with the Lord. Obviously, for all of us, it's a journey, right? There's ebbs and flows. I'm wondering where specifically your faith was maybe while you were going through this experience in 1999 that the movie depicts, but where's your faith then maybe take it through your journey into where it is now. Wow. Um, Early in my life, I just think, wow, why me? My father was physically and verbally abusive. Everything was tied on with four letter curse words. You're not smart enough. You're dumb as God. It gets old. And then I tell audiences, I said, the bruises, they go away. It's the words that stick with you. When you get told how dumb you are, you start to believe that. Mm. And we can live up to or down to expectation. The choice is ours. Early in my life, everywhere except on a ball field of some type, I lived down to expectation. 
well, you're not smart enough. Why study? You'll never amount to anything. Why try? Yeah. But in between the lines of that sports field, I knew I could be the kid I was supposed to be if only for a few hours at a time. And so I relish the sports part of it. As I've gotten older and I've seen things, I've definitely seen God's grace and and saving me some for, from some very poor decisions in my life. And it's, the, it's almost like he's giggling. He's going, are, are you sure? <laughs> Is that the direction you want to take? You know, well, wait a minute. Maybe I don't. And through baseball, especially, you get caught up with before 9-11. We're walking onto the back of planes. We don't even have to go through the airports at the time. They're handing us shrimp cocktails when we get on. And, and people are complaining about that. And I'm like, man. They just handed me more meal money for 10 days and I made too much teaching. Are you kidding me? You're, you're griping about this. But it's the world we're bred into. Yeah. I, had, I played baseball. I didn't succeed. I failed at it. I was out of baseball. And then when I forgot about baseball and I wasn't supposed to do it anymore, God brought it back. He said, you weren't ready then, but you're ready now. When you're doing it for everybody but you, now you're ready. And I think that's why it worked and it worked so well. And there were uh, everybody wanted to to put their impressions on a movie, right? So I met with all the people in Disney and what was amazing to me that the people from Disney had it down like I wanted it. They, um, when I walked into Eisner's office, he goes, well, we will, what we see is a movie about faith and about challenges and about overcoming obstacles and about young people getting a second chance and older people getting a second chance and coming back to that dream you really wanted. And I was sold before I ever walked out of Disney because that is exactly what I wanted, a movie about kids yeah. and a movie about people my age who could overcome. It was that too. And I, again, I went back this weekend. It's on Disney Plus. If you have Disney Plus, go back and watch it. It's really, really good. And it was nice to bring my daughter and sit her down. She's 15. And she remembered hearing about The Rookie when she was younger, I think. But she hadn't sat down and watched it with me. And we loved it, just watching it together. And and uh, it brings chills down your spines. But then I'm watching it. And I'm thinking, all right, I get to interview this guy for real in a couple of days. Let me ask him about specifically the movie. So obviously Hollywood, Hollywood eyes movies as i like to say and they kind of you know were you standing on the side of your car throwing a fastball at a speed you know <laughs> reader on the road and the highway like, what were the things that maybe didn't and i don't care it's not going to spoil me i just think it's great but what were some of the things maybe that they hollywoodized for the movie well the first <laughs> question everybody asked me is is the radar gun on the side of the road did right. that happen yeah. and i go that is hollywood yeah. <laughs> but, but it was done for a particular reason. It was to let everybody know that I had no idea until I got to the tryout how hard I actually threw. Right. Because by the end of the season, one of the things that's left out is that those kids were hitting me all over the park. I couldn't even get high school kids out. So we make the bet. They go from not hitting me at all to killing me. Mm -hmm. And then we get knocked out of the playoffs. I go to a tryout. I don't have any idea how hard I throw because I can't get 16-year-olds out. I go to the tryout. They're going, oh, you threw 98. And I'm like, I've been throwing 98 at high school kids. I'm going to get sued is what I'm getting. And, and <laughs> we're just going to go on from here. But when Dennis filmed that scene and it let everybody know, I had no idea. He loved the scene. It was great to put it in there. And it was great to let everybody know. I had no clue. I'm watching a group of high school kids hit me all over the park. And now I'm going to go to a tryout and embarrass myself thoroughly. And that's not what happened. Sure. It's the opposite. Yeah, no, I loved it. And I thought that that scene, again, I don't mind it. Even if it isn't true, I'm like, this is just entertainment value, but it really puts a mindset into your journey as a player. Can you talk a little bit about, there's a moment in the movie, I don't know if this is real or not, forgive me, because um, I didn't read your book, but the relationship with your dad, and I had, an, I had a complicated relationship with my dad, um, even wrote a book about um, forgiveness and the whole idea of growing up with an alcoholic father and coming to a point where I had to learn how to forgive him. I'm wondering what you learned in your process of forgiveness, because there really is a poignant moment in the movie where you get your, your, your chance and you make your major league debut when it's in Texas with Tampa and you have a ball that you kept and you give it to your father. And again, I don't know if that's true or not because Hollywood can Hollywoodize movies. You can fill that, you know, you know, those gaps in in just a second, but talk about that relationship a little bit and how it evolved as you got older from basically the wounds you, you, I really shook my head when you said, it's not what he did. It's what he said. And those things, those verbal wounds are the ones that stuck the worst. I felt those 
myself. Can you walk us through a little bit about the, the maybe complicated relationship it sounds like you have with your dad? Oh, absolutely. This was a guy who I was born with asthma and it turned into pneumonia within 24 hours. Hmm. And so what does he do? And I don't remember because I'm a baby. My mom told me and I remember when as I was older, the same thing happening. He rode home in the car with the windows up smoking cigarettes with a baby with asthma. It was it was all about him. It was always about him. The most um, destructive thing he ever said to me was when he was holding my little brother one time. And it was right after my mom left the room and he walked up and he goes, you aren't even wanted. Mm. This is the one we wanted. Wow. Wow. And you just go, what did I do? It's your fault that we had to get married. Yeah. Really? And then I went and got a science degree and found out I have nothing whatsoever to do with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was looking to blame everybody else for his problems. And that's why when I went to live with my grandparents at 15, I expected the same thing from them because those were his parents. And then to find out that not only they, but my uncle and the person he's married to are just like my grandparents and they're sweet and they're nice and they're honest and they're loyal and just the integrity that is beyond reproach. And then I look at my family and go, wow, what happened? And it was, it's a long convoluted story, but basically that's how he grew up. And he was angry at people all the time. He always fought. He'd pitch in a little league game so he could hit somebody so he could fight. He just wanted to fight. He was in the military for 20 years. We moved constantly because he liked to fight, even as an adult. And he just liked confrontation. He liked being a bully. And it was, it was very hard to grow up in that situation because something that made him mad this time may not make him mad next time. And then you're panicking. and you're like, I'm going to get a whooping. And then he laughs and then you start laughing and then you get in trouble because you're laughing. It's just all these mixed messages of, am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? Can I do better? Can I do worse? How do I improve this? Where is God in this? Yeah. And I couldn't think of that as a kid, but as an adult, I can, I look back and I go, he was there the whole time. And he saw all of that. And what a blessed life I've lived to be able to get to the point I am. And we've re- my wife and I have raised five kids and they're up and they're out of the house and they're healthy and they're strong and they chase the dreams they wanted to chase because they weren't being told how sorry or stupid they were. They were being built up. Now we didn't, we don't have snowflakes. So we have hardworking young kids and, but I learned how not to parent from my parents. I learned how to parent from my grandparents. Yeah. That's great. Is that scene in the movie uh, realistic? Were you able to kind of have a moment with your father and, 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 and just get that time together with him when you were going through this amazing experience as a major leaguer? Absolutely, man. We're back in my home state first time in three months in front of everybody I know and love. Uh, Johnny Oates, the opposing manager at the time, God bless his soul. Yeah. Let 150 people in the game that day that had ties to me. So I'm in my favorite ballpark in my home state for the first time in three months. I'm getting to see my kids, my high school kids, even kids I coached against. Coaches have gotten school buses driven nine hours just to watch the coach who made a promise. And I walk into this clubhouse and it's just different. And so I pitched the first night. I strike out Royce Clayton. I give the ball to my dad. And standing right there is Fred McGriff, Roberto Hernandez, and Jose Canseco when I do it. And it's just, Hmm. if you draw a plan up, this is what I love about God. We can think of anything we want to about what our biggest and wildest imagination can go. This is my dream. This is what I want to do. And then when it happens, it is so much better than it would have been had we tried to force the issue. And it just happens. And that's how God wanted it. And that's how it's laid out. And this is because... That was the plan. And you're like, all right, I'm along for the ride, man. Let's enjoy this. And so when I was young and it didn't work out, it wasn't, it was all about me. And he said, no. And now it's about everybody but you. So now you got your dream. So yeah, I made, I apologize to my father for me. I didn't forgive him for him. I forgave him for me. And, Mm. oh, but there are so many wounds. What do you do? I keep forgiving him. This is not a one-time deal. And when I notice I'm getting uptight or anxious about something, it usually has to do with him. And 
I'll stop and I forgive him again and I go on and I'm better. And that's just, it's a recurring theme. And I just, I don't want people to go, oh, you forgive me once and that should be forever. And that's not like that because our minds are human and our minds take us back to the negative and we have to make the positive come true. It's so true. Thank you for saying that because that's when I share it, I say the same thing. I, I would, when I came to forgive my dad, it was not about anything he had done or it wasn't for him. It was for me and I needed it. It was, it was, I was the one being held prisoner when I didn't forgive him. That's kind of how I felt. Jim Morris is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Last couple of questions, Jim, again, the new book, I'm excited about it. It's called Dream Makers. Surround yourself with the best to be the best. It's out June 23rd of 2020. I'm excited for it. It'll be available everywhere books are found. Why don't you spend a second, if you could, Jim, just encouraging, because you do that. You're an encourager. You're a professional encourager, right? That's what I call speakers who, who are um, inspirational speakers or speakers that speak about their journeys to encourage others. You're a professional encourager. Spend a moment encouraging those listening right now on this interview um, in their faith. Why faith has been so important to you on this journey and how it sustains you today Encourage them on from that perspective, certainly about chasing dreams. That's important. Believing in yourself, going after everything God has for you. But from a faith perspective, which I really want to hammer home on this on this show, why is that so important to you and encourage those listening and why it should be important or can be important to them? I have seen things get ugly in my life from the time I was a kid, and I have seen some beautiful things in my life. And it's when my faith has been the weakest that I've seen the most incredible things happen. Mm-hmm. And at a time when I think I'm going to break and I can't go a step further and I watch somebody else, or I think about Jesus on a cross after he's been scourged and beat. And then you're going to be hung on a cross and you can't breathe. And then they're going to stab you. And then they're going to give you a sponge with vinegar. And nothing I've been through compares anything close to that. Yeah. And if he could give himself up for our sins because of that, I can be a human and I can make mistakes. But as long as I know where my focal point is and I come back to Christ, I'm going to be good. And so now I've learned it's better just to be good all the time. And so I'm as good as a human can be, I think. I mess up. I say some things I shouldn't say. And then I apologize and I move on. But faith has sustained me in the fact that I saw my grandparents live it every day. And then I watched a group of kids in a public school who I prayed for them and they prayed for me and we pushed each other and we made each other better. Uh, Faith for me is sitting on the hood of my car going, the last time I left Big Lake, getting out, sitting on my hood, looking up and just praying, going, do I take this next job in Fort Worth at this great big high school or do I go play baseball like these kids wanted? God, I'm stupid. You know this. You've been around me a long time. You've known me before I was here. Please point me in the right direction. If this is what you want me to do, you've got to set this up. And he set it up better than I ever could myself. When I needed money and I was playing minor league ball again, I would get a glove contract. It would end up in Sports Illustrated, my picture. They see a glove I'm using. I get a glove contract. The money goes home. I get to stay longer and play. Again, you're questioning, do I stay here and do this childhood dream or do I move on? And then a shoe contract, a glove contract, money goes home, I stay in play. And it just kept being answered. If this is what I'm supposed to do, just let me know. And it keeps being answered. So instead of going, God, I want this, I want this. God, show me what it is you want for me. Because it doesn't matter in my mind what picture I paint and how pretty it is. His pictures are way prettier. And the best we think we could possibly have is not even close to what he can bring us. And so my faith is my faith because of my grandparents, my high school kids, and because of the things I've seen and I've been a part of. I had neurosurgeons go, nobody ever, ever, ever gets well from Parkinson's. Hmm. So they did the brain scan and now my dopamine is fine. And they're like, (laughs) nobody else gets well from Parkinson's if they can't explain it. If they don't have faith. Now, the guy who put my deep brain stimulator in, that neurosurgeon, he has a lot of faith, too. And so he and I have kind of giggled about stuff. And the book Dream Makers has a feather on it for a reason. And I want people to get into it. I want them to read that 
And there's going to be probably some pretty strong feelings on he's a crackpot or wow, this worked. Because all I can tell you now is after 20 years of chasing a diagnosis, having one, and then having the medication for Parkinson's work, but it ruined my stomach, having my stomach cut out, and then, oh, oh, we're going to pray for you. Oh, you're well. You don't have Parkinson's. He keeps showing me that he's there every single day. And it's not up for me to sit around and be still. It's up for me to do what I can to make me a better person through him. And so if I can go to the church, if anybody wants to talk to me, I'll talk to anybody about faith. The biggest thing, and we talked about this earlier, is do people want to be my friend or do they want to be the rookie's friend? Mm -hmm. That's been the hardest thing for me is trying to discern the difference between the two. But if somebody just wants, hey, can this happen? Can you pray for me? Absolutely, man. Let's go. And it's been an amazing journey and it's not over because he just keeps opening doors to things I never knew were there. Four weeks ago, who would have thought, hey, you're going to get a microphone and lights and we're going to start doing virtual meetings. <laughs> that was foreign to me. As foreign as 20 years ago when my agent goes, you're going to be a motivational speaker. And I went, you are out of your mind. <laughs> and, and so he brings this guy from Kansas City down to train me for five days he comes to my apartment in Dallas and we have a, a theater room in there and he sets his camera up and he films me and he goes, okay, do it again. And I did it again. And he went, you know what? We don't need any more Tony Robbins. They're going to love you for you. You go out and be you and you'll be fine. And he went home first day. And I've been doing that for 20 years. I've been me. And my prayer before every time I step out, with a microphone on is God, please let me reach the person you're trying to reach today. If you yeah. give me the word to say that, that person that you're trying to reach today, it's not a whole group. It's not everybody involved, but if you help me reach the one person you want to reach, then I feel like I've done my job for the day. And so I look for the person who's not paying attention at all. And once I get their attention, I know I'm going where I should be. He is Jim Morris. This has been great. The rookie, former Major League Baseball pitcher, now speaker and author, of course. New book again. It's called Dream Makers. Surround yourself with the best to be the best. Out June 23rd, 2020. You know, the only other question I wanted to really ask you, Jim, how often do you watch the movie? When it's on, are you popping? Are you stopping and watching it? Or are you like, listen, I live that. I don't need to ever watch it again. Or are you tuning in every so often when that movie pops up? It is a strange thing to be on a movie set and the 300 people on a movie set are filming a movie about you. Yeah. And the you know, third day on the set, Dennis came over. He goes, you might as well enjoy this. This is about you. This doesn't happen for everybody. And so that kind of calmed me down then. But then during the filming process, Disney people would come by and go, so if you could have anybody you wanted to show up at the premiere, who would it be? Who are your favorite ball players? What's going on? And so they asked the same thing at Dennis and we get the premiere and we're like, let's go have fun. This is a premiere. The night before the premiere, I am at the 21 club with Dennis. They have 21 hall of famers and they've just seen the movie and we're having dinner with them. Wow. And it is the most amazing time of my life. And so Dennis and I are just taking it in, man. These ball players are awesome. And they've been around the block and they're crying because they watch my movie. That's even better. They're all in the Hall of Fame. And then my agent walked around telling people their stats in the eighth inning with two outs and with people on first and second. This is what you hit. And I'm like, how do you know that, dude? Hmm. It's like 80 years ago. But it was so much fun. And then the next night, all of us go watch the premiere. And I'll be honest with you, the first time I saw the movie, Disney came to me, they go, we want you to come see the product. I go, it's three and a half hours long. It's in black and white. There's sound gas. There's no music. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Two weeks later, literally, I am in Nashville doing a national religious broadcasters convention and they're going to watch the movie. And then I have to get up and talk to them. I watch the movie and I have to stop crying before I can get up. Wow. That's how hard it hit me. And it was just like reliving it. And Dennis and I have done that through those years of getting ready to film and then filming and then going out and talking about it and reliving it. But when you see it on film and you're like, wow, it still feels like it's foreign to me and it's not really a part of me, 
but I am in this picture, it's the most bizarre thing. And so during the premiere, I got up like 10 times and went to the bathroom because I was just, is this real? Is this happening? And then we go to the party afterwards and I'm meeting Olympic athletes who are letting me hold their medals and they're like, I became an Olympic athlete because of you. I almost gave up and I didn't. And I'm like, wow. wow. And I think that's when things started to hit me like, this might mean something. This might mean something to more, more to somebody than what I'm giving it credit for. So if someone wants to pick up a bat again and try, or someone wants to pick up a glove, or someone wants to play football, or someone gets fired from their job because everybody got laid off for two months during the coronavirus, dreams don't end. Yeah, There are different doors to walk through. Which one, which one are you going to walk through? Are we going to do this the right way? Are we going to keep God in front? Because forever I went, God is my co-pilot. And they're like, why would God be your co-pilot? If he was with you, wouldn't he drive? And I'm like, good point. <laughs> I'm going to go where God takes me. And so we're just going to go at it like that. And there are dreams. They come true. And sometimes things can't be explained away through medical science. Yeah. I know 18 years later after the movie comes out, I watched it just this past weekend and it, it, it moved me and impacted me as much as it will impact you if you watch it. Jim Morris, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Again, the book is called Dream Makers. June 23rd, 2020 is when it's out. Go pick it up. Really appreciate it. Jim, thanks so much. You've been a blessing to me and thanks so much for your time and all the best to you. God bless you. Thank you. And many thanks to Jim Morris, the rookie, for joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Again, the book is called Dream Makers. Surround yourself with the best to be the best. It's out June 23rd of 2020. Of course, his life story, his baseball journey was depicted in Disney's movie, The Rookie, that released back in 2002. And I, again, watched it this weekend. It was great. It was on Disney Plus. It is on Disney Plus. You can go check it out as well. It's a perfect movie around this time of year to get you excited about sports, hopefully getting back to that sports life soon since we're in the middle of this quarantine as we tape this interview. And uh, listen, Jim's just an awesome guy. He even stayed on for a few minutes after our taping to tell me a little bit more about his surgeries, about his Parkinson's diagnosis, which God has completely healed him from, which is amazing. And even from some of these things that he were he was looking to continue as far as a baseball journey and career goes back in the early 2000s that um, you know some of these uh, medical issues got in the way of. But he's a great guy. He's got a great heart. And uh, he could not have been more of a gentleman during his time with me on and off the air. Jim Morris, support his ministry by picking up his book and certainly go watch The Rookie one more time with your family. It's rated G, perfect for all families. It's a great movie. Just watch it. You'll love it. Jim Morris, and he joined us here on Sports Spectrum. Also want to thank Ronald Blue Trust, our sponsors here at Sports Spectrum today. Check them out at ronblue.com to learn about their great work that they are doing as financial planners and professionals, and maybe they can help you in your financial endeavors. Ron Blue. Dot com. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Also want to direct you to our website, sportspectrum.com, for all of our content, sportspectrum.com. We have daily devotionals there. We have articles on the intersection of sports and faith. Every single podcast, including this interview we did with Jim, is available over at sportspectrum.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Love you guys. I hope you all have a great rest of your day.